my name is Carl Gershman. I just want to uh, welcome everyone to uh, to this event today. And I I think that I think that the report uh, that we're releasing, which has been written by Chris Walker and Jessica Ludwig on the use of sharp power by Russia and China is an unusually uh, important report. Um, as I think people know, it introduces a new term and a new concept, the concept of sharp power that clarify and illuminate the dangerous challenge posed by these two major authoritarian powers and the way they are building stronger barriers at home to the ex external political and cultural influences, but also even as they are simultaneously taking advantage of the openness of democratic systems abroad to manipulate and distort the information that reaches the general public. This report is a prism, I think, through which the growing threat to democratic countries and the culture of freedom posed by Russia and China can be viewed and understood. You'll hear more about this, of course, today. And for now, I just, I wanna thank and congratulate uh, Chris and Jessica. Chris for his leadership on this issue and on so many other issues that we deal with. And Jessica for <coughs> co-authoring the overview essay with Chris and for overseeing uh, the whole effort, which has involved coordinating the country reports, which are 10 to 15,000 words each, produced by our think tank partners and keeping all of the trains running on track and on time with all of the various meetings and discussions that have been held related to this initiative. In addition to thanking our think tank partners, I want to note that they are members of the network of democracy research institutes, which is a global network of some 80, more than 80 think tanks that conduct research and analysis on democracy. The Institute of Public Affairs in Warsaw, under the leadership of Jacek Kaczarczyk, did the research on Poland. The Institute of, for Public Affairs in Bratislava, led by Grigorz Mesevnikov, covered Slovakia, and Juan Pablo Cardinal at Kadal, the Center for the Opening and Development of Latin America in Buenos Aires, handled Argentina and Peru. All three think tanks are either have been or uh, are uh, NED grantees, and we're just very pleased to work with these longtime partners on such an important <coughs> subject. It's now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Shanti Kalatil, the director of <coughs> NED's, the, NED's International Forum for Democratic Studies, our research arm, uh, who will moderate the first panel. Shanti. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Carl. Um, we're so pleased. It should be on, Mike. So we're so pleased that you all could join us today for the launch of our report on sharp power. Um, as we'll explore today, uh, modern authoritarian influence efforts uh, are of a different tenor than what we typically think of as soft power. And in our two panels today, we'll explore various aspects of that. Our first panel today is designed to really delve into some of the findings that were produced by our think tank partners as they examined authoritarian influence in vulnerable democracies. So looking particularly at Chinese and Russian influence in Argentina, Peru, and Slovakia and Poland. Um, what we'll do today is we'll just have some um, brief remarks about the overview and then we'll turn to Grigory Mesheznikov and Juan Pablo Cardinal to talk about their findings. Um, but I would like to emphasize at the outset that this report does form part of a broader effort <coughs> by the forum to look at authoritarian influence. Many of you are probably familiar with previous work by the forum on authoritarian resurgence, uh, which culminated in the book Authoritarianism Going Global. Um, and uh, we were pleased to launch actually just last week a new blog that will also be exploring new forms of modern authoritarian influence, essentially looking at how authoritarian regimes and illiberal regimes are now able to use the open networks and other institutions of democracies and globalization against democracies. So if you're interested in checking that out, please do. Uh, the blog is called Power 3.0, and there should be a little flyer about that, uh, which you can pick up. 
Um, I also wanted to let people know about a related event that's taking place tomorrow at the Council of the Americas, which will feature some of our speakers here today. That event will focus particularly on Chinese and Russian influence in the Americas. And uh, that will take place at the Ronald Reagan Building. So um, since we are, in essence, sort of working in complementary fashion with them on this, uh, if you're interested in the Americas, please do check out that event. And there are more details on their website at the Council of the Americas. Um, so with that, I think we can get started. Um, before I turn it over to Jessica to introduce the structure of the report uh, and the inventory of authoritarian influence, I wanted to remind people to please silence your cell phones. And uh, you're also able to follow along with the conversation at Think Democracy. Um, and if you would like to tweet about it, we're using a special hashtag today, the hashtag Sharp Power. So uh, with that, Jessica. Thank you, Shanti. And uh, before I get started, I first of all want to thank our think tank partners uh, and contributing authors to the report. They have really done a tremendous job of conducting very difficult on the ground local research on China and Russia's activities in their own countries. Um, so thank you so much for your very rigorous <laughs> uh, research and um, also being willing to respond to questions that uh, we've posed to you over the course of the research. Um, and in addition, I should also mention uh, Grigory's co-author, Gabriela Plashova, who uh, contributed a significant amount of research um, to the Slovakia case study. So in undertaking this report, um, one of the principal challenges that uh, is generally faced in studying the nature of China and Russia's influence efforts around the world is that they're dispersed among a number of different regions and different countries. So to understand what's happening at the local level, we decided to take a comparative approach with this report by working with our think tank partners um, who could observe uh, the initiatives that the Chinese and Russian governments, as well as their surrogates, are undertaking on the ground in their countries. And then we ask them to analyze uh, the impact of those activities within their local national context. Um, and it's important to note that really, when we were thinking about the countries that we could have selected for this report, or the regions that we <coughs> wanted to include in the comparison, we could have included any number of countries from around the world, from many different regions. Um, in including Southeast Europe, where Russia and China are both increasingly active, as well as um, some other authoritarian states from the Middle East. Um, China has, of course, been very involved in Africa for many years, uh, investing a lot in international development uh, funds, and as well as in the media sphere there, um, as well as in Asia. And even more recent events have shown us that even the advanced democracies of the world are not exempt from China and Russia's influence activities. Uh, there are things happening every day in Australia uh, with regards to China's uh, political influence activities there and efforts to uh, interfere in the media space, as well as in academia. Uh, New Zealand, Canada, uh, many countries in Western <coughs> Europe, and of course here in the US. But we decided to focus uh, on some of the more vulnerable countries around the world uh, by looking at young democracies, because young democracies, um, although they have, you know, some of these countries we had thought, you know, had recently consolidated their, their democratic processes, Overall, their institutions in civil society, well, their institutions and democratic roots are still shallow, and civil society is still developing there. Um, so these countries also make attractive targets um, for China and Russia. In addition, we also decided to focus on Central Europe and Latin America because of their uh, proximity and strategic value to the established democracies of North America and Western Europe. Um, so then in selecting the four case countries, Peru, Argentina, Poland, and Slovakia, we wanted to look at uh, countries where uh, there was a relatively high level of freedom, and additionally, where we also had uh, good high quality research partners that we could work with. Um, of course, there's always that practical matter to consider when you want to undertake research. As far as the research methods, our partners 
uh, conducted uh, on the ground an on the ground inventory of initiatives taking place in four different spheres. These are media, academia, culture, and the think tank and policy communities in their country. To do the research, they aggregated and analyzed prior research that had been done by local scholars, journalists, and think tanks. They conducted a number of qualitative interviews, and I think this was actually quite an intensive process for them to do. So um, again, I you know, I think we all really appreciate uh, the insights that they were able to gather through those <coughs> interviews. Uh, they also surveyed themes that are covered regularly in the print and online media, as well as in social media. And then they examined topics of events and projects that are organized by Chinese and Russian cultural institutes, uh, by local universities that were done in conjunction with Russian and Chinese partners, um, as well as uh, events that were organized by research institutions based in each of their countries. I think it's also important to recognize that the authoritarian activities in the ideas realms of democracies represent only a portion of a much greater set of activities that China and Russia are engaged in. Um, so if we think of it about it like an iceberg, we're studying only the part that's visible uh, in democracies uh, but we do want to acknowledge that China and Russia are undertaking a number of different, far more nefarious types of influence activities, but these were outside the scope of uh, what we were able to study in this report. So when our research partners took a closer look at the ways that Russia and China are attempting to leverage many traditional soft power tools, we observed many differences in the ways that China and Russia are, uh, as authoritarian trendsetter regimes, are seeking to engage with democratic societies abroad. Above all, what distinguishes their attempts to project influence abroad from traditional soft power is a top-down model of control over the civil society organizations and other institutions that engage in international activities on their behalf. And ultimately, these activities are aimed at suppressing pluralism and free expression in free and open societies beyond China and Russia's borders. So uh, briefly, before I turn it over to our think tank analysts and researchers, um, I'll just uh, cover five different techniques that we observe the authoritarians using when we um, looked comparatively at all four of the case countries. <laughs> The first approach that the authoritarians use is amplifying selective narratives. Um, it's important to note that really it's, you can't understand uh, the nature or even fully assess the impact that authoritarians like China and Russia have in a uh, country without also considering the domestic uh, political context. And China and Russia are very attuned to what's happening in different countries around the world, and they identify narratives that they can highlight, uh, and they tailor these, of course, to those individual countries um, to try and exploit uh, political <coughs> polarization as well as other tensions that exist in those democratic systems. Another trend uh, that's important to note is that China and Russia invest a lot of not just financial resources, but also human resources in cultivating personal relationships. And they do this by focusing on the people who are the most influential in democratic societies. So the thought leaders, politicians, academics, media, uh, journalists, as well as editors, um, all in an attempt to help proactively shape how these individuals are presenting their own country, or, sorry, are presenting Russia and China within their own country. And the way that they're able to do this is by taking advantage of knowledge gaps that exist within these democratic countries. So uh, for example, I think this is especially the case with China. Of course, um, in Central Europe, there's a very long history with Russia um, being active in the region, but uh, there, it's much more difficult to find knowledgeable experts uh, who, who know China very well. There's, these are very small communities of of uh, experts and observers in these young democracies because the resources often just aren't there to support, uh, you know, 
uh, many China studies programs or in the media outlets to support a, a journalist who might focus specifically on China. Um, a fourth uh, strategy that the authoritarians use is they control access to culture. Culture is, of course, often understood as one of the most important organic components of soft power. But China and Russia privilege certain types of culture, cultural activities and cultural initiatives, artists, writers, uh, those who are willing w to present the official line. Uh, <coughs> For China's part, uh, the Confucius Institutes, uh, which are located on university campuses around the world and are present in all four of the case countries that were examined in the report, um, for example, emphasize a number of cultural and educational activities that seem very innocuous, such as, of course, Chinese language classes, calligraphy. Um, but at the same time, they also organize events that very clearly support the Chinese Communist Party positions, uh, such as um, events and photo exhibitions that emphasize China's uh, territorial claims over Tibet and other regions uh, that are, uh, where there are a lot of political tensions within China. And noticeably absent from the Chinese and Russian cultural activities that were organized in these countries, um, are uh, artists and academics and themes that are critical of Beijing and Moscow's policies. And this is really, when we think about it, consistent with the domestic environments in Russia and China where discussion about certain topics is often heavily controlled. And finally, the fifth area that uh, is worth noting and which was not sort of originally envisioned as part of our, uh, I think, initial research, but came out of it uh, is that China and Russia are attempting to leverage their overseas communities and bring them under their own sphere of influence. Um, and this is happening regardless of an individual's current citizenship. So they may indeed be citizens of the four case countries. Uh, their ancestors may have immigrated from China or Russia a century ago, but Russia and China are actively seeking to engage with these individuals and then use them uh, as groups that can potentially mobilize in favor of, of the regime in their own uh, democracy. This type of effort has been especially visible in Australia, which of course is not something that we covered in the report, but uh, about which there is um, much media coverage right now, so I would just mention that. Uh, so in conclusion, what's really troubling about these strategies is the way that the regimes in Russia and China are trying to exploit the opportunities of globalization, while at the same time rejecting its underlying principles, or what we have always assumed were the underlying principles of free and open exchange. They've learned how to leverage open information environments to their own advantage so that they can reshape the discourse and discussion around the nature of their regimes uh, in open and democratic societies around the world. So I'll leave it there and of course, I guess, uh, turn it over to our think tank analysts. Great, thank you so much, Jessica. Why don't we go to Grigory now and you can talk a little bit about <coughs> your findings from Slovakia. Yeah, thank you very much. First of all, I, I'm really happy to be here today. Very pleased that I had opportunity with my colleague and my institute to participate in this, I think, outstanding project. Thank you very much to uh, Chris and Jessica for their very strong leadership, their methodological approach, which really helped us to elaborate, I think, uh, the unique report, which I hope will bring not only new knowledge, but also will affect uh, uh, activities of uh, those forces, democratic forces in all four countries, which are which really care about uh, liberal democracy, about reforms, about transformation, about, in case of uh, Central Europe, our membership in the European Union and NATO, because uh, all these issues somehow are in the optics of uh, implementation of uh, Russian and Chinese soft power. Uh, speaking about these two countries, uh, in the context of Central Europe, I have to emphasize that uh, 
these countries are different. Uh, they have uh, different uh, um, experience and the past in their, I would say, <laughs> operation in Central Europe, but there are some similarities. And the main similarity is that both countries are <coughs> challenging this, this uh, I mean, Russia and China is authoritarian power. They are challenging in different manner, but nevertheless, uh, the choice made by nations of this uh, region. In case of Russia, I think that uh, when we are analyzing how uh, Russia is implementing, especially in the last three, four years, its so-called soft but de facto sharp power, it indicates that Russia still consider the process of uh, reform after the collapse of communism as reversible. Despite the situation that uh, more than uh, uh, 25 years ago, after the collapse of communism, these countries really passed through the uh, very profound uh, process of uh, reforms. Today, they are members of European Union and NATO. They have a functional market economy. But what uh, Russia is in the last years, especially after uh, Russian-Ukrainian war de facto started, <coughs> consider possibili considers possibility to somehow reverse this process and even really sounds not very re realistically, but we know that in uh, all these countries there are some Eurosceptic forces, extremist forces, which are openly uh, speaking about uh, the liberal values, about our membership in the EU and NATO, that uh, at the end, if the situation will allow, then uh, the ultimate goal of such efforts will be will not only weakening our ties with uh, the dem community of democratic states, with the European Union and NATO, but uh, even maybe withdrawal for, for, from these two organizations. Uh, so uh, we can consider Russian soft or uh, rather sharp power, uh, which, is which this country is implementing in Central Europe, including Slovakia. And in Slovakia, there are some special reasons for uh, relative success of, of Russian actors in uh, sharp power. Uh, based on peculiarity of, uh, of de uh, development in this country, uh, ethnic composition, uh, traditions, and so on, of the population. Uh, and uh, we can consider these uh, efforts as a part of the broader, uh, I would say, hybrid war which Russia is today conducting against the West. And of course, uh, consider being uh, <coughs> Central European countries being uh, members of this collective West uh, EU and NATO are the targets of, uh, of these uh, uh, soft power or sh sharp power measures. I can uh, tell more about the narratives which uh, Russia is uh, using, uh, trying to uh, strengthen its position in the region. Of course, uh, it's not realistic to expect that Russia uh, will somehow uh, return uh, to the same positions as Soviet Union had uh, before the collapse of communism, uh, but uh, uh, feeling that there are some internal forces which are very helpful and uh, they are com uh, committed actors of these uh, uh, activities inside, uh, inside Central Europe, especially in, s in Slovakia, I think that uh, uh, Russia is uh, permanently uh, behaving as a state which uh, as a problem with liberal democracy as a, as a political model, with the European integration as a project which is bringing together uh, Western uh, Europe and Eastern and Central Europe, and the country which is using uh, the, I would say, natural reasons for the possible uh, penetration into the social fabric uh, in, in this uh, part of Europe, especially in Slovakia. Now, just if I can, three or maybe four uh, sentences about which of these uh, of about each of these narratives. The first narrative, which is quite visible when Russian uh, sharp power is addressing the uh, general population in the country, is the narrative about uh, inefficiency uh, of liberal democracy. And the liberal democracy is a system which is not, uh, f which doesn't fit to small nations in this part of Europe. So liberal democracy is uh, uh, painted, pictured as a non-productive, very inefficient uh, system based on, quite paradoxically, non-transparent procedures that the corruption is a component factor of liberal democracy. And uh, of course, it undermines uh, 
uh, the approach or can undermine the approach of uh, part of the population to the values of, of uh, liberal democracies on which uh, our society is based. The second narrative, uh, quite sensitive, is narrative about specific ties uh, existing between Russia and uh, smaller Slavic uh, nations in Central Europe. It's quite a uh, funny thing that uh, when uh, we are listening this narrative in Slovakia, that uh, this uh, pan-Slavic brotherhood or pan-Slavic solidarity should inevitably mean special relations between, let's say, Slovakia and Russia, that somehow people are f uh, forgetting that uh, other Slavic nations like Czechs, <coughs> Poles, Bulgarians, uh, Croatians, Slovenians, uh, even now Ukrainians uh, and, and Macedonians and uh, Balkan Slavic nations are trying to be in the uh, European Union, but the previously mentioned countries, they are even now already in European Union and NATO, but the narrative is that uh, strengthening the, uh, the ties between Slavic nations inevitably uh, would lead to the strengthening uh, relations between Russia as a traditional, traditional defender of the inst uh, inst interest of small uh, Slavic nations and this, uh, these nations. So it means that th this narrative, the goal of this narrative is to somehow re relativize uh, the significance of social values in relations between the countries and uh, in, in internal development of these countries and the preference of this ethnic ethnic closeness, uh, linguistic uh, proximity and so on. And uh, there, are some, uh, there are some factors which are enabling uh, Russian uh, actors and pro-Russian actors in Slovakia to use this narrative. Uh, yeah. And the, th the third narrative, which is also quite visible, uh, especially in relations in the context of uh, membership of uh, these countries in European Union, NATO, that, that West is... Uh, uh it's an actor which is uh, it's a kind of social predator. So the cooperation or even membership in uh, Western uh, institutions is weakening positions of the smaller states, that only West is benefiting from this, that the smaller states are not benefiting at all, that they are in, uh, that the West is in dominant situation and using uh, this situation for its own benefit. So these three narratives are quite visible in public discourse of Slovakia. Uh, and as I said, uh, especially since uh, uh, annexation of Crimea uh, and uh, Russian-Ukrainian war in eastern part of Ukraine, uh, Russia really intensified uh, very much uh, its efforts uh, in this in this direction. Uh, why uh, for Russia, Slovakia is uh, in quotation mark interesting? Uh, area for implementation of its soft power. It's not only because of uh, this uh, uh, opportunity to use this traditional pan-Slavic sentiment, but also from one side uh, considering Slovakia as a country which probably in favorable from the Russian point of view uh, situation can weaken uh, its relations uh, and its positions in inside European Union, at the same time being a member of European Union and in the context of uh, Russian-Ukrainian war is uh, now uh, Russia trying to neutralize the negative impact uh, uh, to the image of this country after its participation in aggression against Ukraine. And the second, of course, very important goal is uh, to reach the situation in which Central European countries and uh, Slovakia is a part of the deal in quotation mark, would be those members of European Union who would act in favor of Russia inside European Union, especially today, it's very sensitive and painful for Russia uh, issue, lifting the or weakening the sanctions which European Union, the West, but European Union as a part of the West, imposed to Russia as a kind of uh, repercussion for its uh, aggression against against Ukraine. So I think that uh, 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 having this uh, uh, authoritarian power as a main actor of uh, implementation of this soft or rather, again, uh, sharp power. I think that all democratic actors in Central Europe should be aware that uh, it's not just the presentation of some other alternative social model. And uh, <coughs> de facto, Russia is not presenting the current its current model as a kind of uh, universal alternative model for other countries, but it's just uh, f uh, the main goal is uh, uh, something which can uh, weaken the basement of 
our own uh, social fabricant. I, ho I hope that uh, the report which we prepared in cooperation with uh, uh, two partners, uh, institutions, thanks to support from NAD, will help to discover all these uh, risks and to make the public more aware <laughs> about uh, the sharp power of authoritarian forces in Central Europe. Right. <coughs> Thank you so much, Grigory. Now let's turn to Juan Pablo, who can talk a little bit about the uh, cases of Peru and Argentina. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to extend my gratitude to Chris and Jessica and to Ned for putting forward this, what I think is a very important uh, research that, and very timely that had to, to be done somehow, sometime. Um, I'd li I like to start by sharing with you um, a, a piece of news that I, I am not aware that has, b has been widely b been published uh, in the last few days, which is the fact that uh, there was a three-day meeting this past weekend in Beijing uh, organized by the Communist Party. They invited uh, representatives of 300 plus political parties of 120 countries with uh, no really, as far as I can tell, no hard agenda. It was about flying in business class and staying in five-star hotels, doing visits. I guess that lots of uh, um, speeches. And one of them uh, by Xi Jinping, in which he said that he was expecting uh, to invite 15,000 uh, representatives of, uh, of uh, political par parties all around the world to China up to the year 2022. I think this is a very good example of the kind of um, uh, soft power strategy that, that China has in place. Turning specifically to, to Latin America and to Argentina and Peru, which uh, we've been researching, uh, I like to, I think, I always like to put in context, in context one idea, which is if we would uh, had been all here uh, 15 years ago, in the year 2001, 2002, when, when China launched uh, the go-out strategy. And China at that time was, um, uh, China's presence in Latin America was, was pretty small. Nobody, uh, probably nobody in this room would have even guessed that at 15 years later, China is already the number one or number two trading partner of most uh, countries in the region, and also the first or second investor, not to say the number one uh, country in, in giving loans to, to the Latin American countries or building infrastructure. So I think this, has, uh, this is something that China has accomplished in little over one decade. It's done, it's going to continue, and China, in my view, is in another phase. In, it's in the phase of gaining uh, political influence. They already have a lot of influence because they are an economic power, but on top of that, they have this um, soft power, uh, sharp power um, strategy that it's in all over the <coughs> world, not only in Latin America, that is, uh, is, is, is a thought in order to gain more political power than what they have today. Uh, I want to add uh, uh, in brackets one idea, which is uh, um, this term coined by, by Chris and, and, and Jessica, um, uh, sharp power. I think it's, it's, it's very, very accurate because uh, I don't really think that we could, what, what, uh, what uh, I've uh, seen myself and my colleagues also in, in, in bo by both China and, and Russia, what they are doing in those countries is not exactly soft power. Soft power, according to the concept uh, of Joseph Nier, has to do with uh, it's something positive. It has to do with being attractive. It's about um, being appealing and, and be, be the attractiveness of your way of life, your political system, your values, your culture, etc. There's some elements of that in China's soft power, in, in at least in the countries that I've researched. But I wouldn't say that this is the main uh, part of, of their strategy. They are basically trying to push this um, sharp power uh, strategy by putting money on top of the table. They are um, 
financing, op opening uh, Confucius Institutes, funding, there's funding for all kinds of exchange programs, uh, for scholarships, they are producing free media content that, that then they give for free uh, to the media uh, partners in, in, in those countries. So I think really think it's, it's uh, basically about, uh, about uh, money. China has um, different um, initiatives in, its, in this strategy. For, w for me, what has been most impressive is the what they call the people-to-people -people diplomacy. Xi Jinping himself said in, in 2016 that uh, China would uh, grant 10,000 Latin Americans uh, the opportunity of being trained in China up to the year 2019, if I, if I recall, 2019 or 2020. Um, what's that? I mean, basically, uh, and Jessica mentioned a little bit about it, it has to do with engaging with the local elites. L who are the local elites? The people that the Chinese think that in different fields may have an impact. So we are talking about uh, people that are opinion uh, leaders, uh, policy makers, people in Congress, people of um, political parties, academics, former diplomats. People that uh, eventually, by engaging with them and taking them to China in different kinds of programs, some are just uh, visits, very touristic type of, of visits, some are trainings, but not trainings in the, in the way that we would understand it. Uh, it's, it's more about, my view is that it's more about exposing those people to the, to the, to the regime's propaganda, in fact. And what they are willing to achieve with this is having what they call friendship envoys or de facto ambassadors of the Chinese cause. Um, the main, um, w I mean, what, what is the purpose of, of doing that? I think there's a, a number of them. First of all, I think that China has understood that they cannot be in the region how they, how they are only with, uh, with the money and the investments. There's already, slowly, there's a growing debate surfacing over the new dependency uh, for the Latin American countries over the asymmetric relationship between China and the Latin American uh, countries. And, and, I, and, I, and I think China wants to have a, a, a more friendly uh, face in, in the region. But also it has to do with neutralizing what they believe is a biased image uh, of China that is uh, somehow promoted by the Western media. They want to be in the region explaining what China is all about through their own version of, of uh, or, th or their own views. Of course, in this process, and you can, you can read uh, those people that are being taken to China that come back home, they write articles, they participate in, in, in conferences, and many of them repeat, amazingly, they repeat the, the party line narrative, you know, and, and they are somehow legitimizing, le le legitimizing uh, the Chinese regime, which I think is one of the purposes of, the, of Beijing also. And you can see th those people uh, that are technically elites um, spreading the views of the Communist Party of China. On top of that, I would argue that uh, they also want to build some kind of uh, friendly environment uh, in the same way that the, um, they would do in business. You know that uh, I'm sure you all know that they always say that you need to build trust uh, with the Chinese before you can think of doing business with them. I think it's it's a similar situation. They want to to have this friendly environment, be connected to the proper people, and and eventually that country can become an ally <coughs> for them. One uh, important uh, idea that I want to mention also is who are the actors of this. Uh, Chinese uh, sharp power. As I mentioned at the very beginning, the Communist Party is extremely active in, in, in inviting uh, political parties with dis without distinction of ideology, uh, and they take them there and they meet with uh, Communist Party leaders, they take them to see, to, to visit uh, 
uh, different sites, etc. No more than that. It's just about personal engagement. But then on the part of the state, there's a joint effort by different government agencies and entities uh, to push forward this uh, soft power, sharp power uh, uh, agenda. And this is, uh, I mean, when I say different entities, I, I'm talking from the embassies themselves to friendship associations, to the Confucius Institutes, um, universities, different ministries. Uh, there's everybody has in its ambit, it has a role to play. And, and uh, my experience on during doing the research is that many of those people that engage with them are not always aware that their peers or their counterparts belong some in a way or another to the Chinese state. They all row in, in the same direction of the state trying to fulfill the national goals. And this is something that locally I, I've, 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 I've it's been very clear to me that when uh, Xinhua, maybe Xinhua not, but when a Chinese media delegation uh, arrives in, in, in those countries or a friendship association or a university, they believe that it's, uh, they are pretty independent from the government, you know? And uh, they, 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 don't, uh, they don't really understand that they, it's, it's all the same thing. Um, one last thing on the actors, just to give you an example. To, to, so you understand how everybody is pushing in this direction. The Chinese ambassador in Buenos Aires, according to the research that I did, only through the information that is published in their website, the Chinese embassy's website, during the last three years that he has been in office there, he, did t he participated himself in 22, he, he had 22 meetings with congressmen or political parties, he participated in 21 academic events. He um, paid visits, which I find quite fishy, to be honest, uh, in eight newsrooms to visit the managers of, of, of local uh, media. He granted uh, 10 interviews to the local media. And more importantly, he has authored 14 op-ed articles in the in the last three years, of course, I've I've gone through those articles. It's not that he, they, he has a very sophisticated view of the international affairs or whatever. I can tell you, it's party nine propaganda. Just to finish, um, this uh, fact that nobody understands who their the Chinese uh, counterparts are leads me to ex to tell you what also Jessica mentioned, which is the lack of awareness. I mean, I think money. It's a very important uh, element of what's going on, but in combination with the lack of awareness, it, it's a powerful mix, you know, because uh, the general population, like I would, I don't think it's unique to Latin America. I think it's probably all the countries in the world, but the local <coughs> po the populations have a very basic and stereotyped views of China. What is more surprising is that the ruling class I think they have very limited knowledge, which was came to a surprise uh, to me. The general image is that uh, and you talk to them and they say, well, we don't have historical or territorial disputes with them. Uh, here, our This is the partner that is going to give us the con economic opportunities that the West uh, maybe cannot do anymore. And uh, th they are the source of loans and investments, etc. And this partner is not the old communist China, it's the China that has gone through this economic transition during the last four decades so successfully, plus has gone past the 2008 uh, financial crisis quite well, quite untouched. So that's what th the kind of thing they say. The only people that I would argue that have a real good knowledge of what China and its regime are all about are the academics. But the academics face another kind of problem, which is um, if you are critical, you most likely are not invited to events, so you have no visibility. And they all know very well where the red lines are. And if they cross those red lines, they are risking future access to China or to their Chinese uh, peers. Thank you. Okay, terrific. Well, lots of food for thought there. Um, I thought I would kick off our discussion uh, portion by asking all of you, um, since you've all looked at both 
Chinese and Russian influence in these different settings, what do you see as the main similarities and main differences between the two approaches? So Grigory, you mentioned that there are particular narratives that Russia is trying to promote. And Juan Pablo, you talked about sort of the, the narrative that China is trying to establish and also the different actors they're reaching out to. Could you just talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, and Grigory, why don't you start? I think that <coughs> I think that the main similarity is that it's also a challenge, but it's different challenge. If uh, <laughs> Russia is challenging the whole process of tra of transition, uh, transformation, membership in European Union, and so on, the China is challenging in a way which indicates that they. I mean, Chinese, they are differentiating between the old Europe and the so-called new Europe. Because, you know, what is the reason why China invited 16 uh, post-communist countries in this specific kind of partnership? So it means that it fi uh, China feels that it can be more successful in the post-communist world and uh, its interests can be more successfully introduced and implemented uh, in the framework of this very peculiar, very peculiar partnership. Officially, uh, when this format, 16 plus one, so it, it's 16 post-communist countries, 11 of them are members of European Union, five are applicant countries, plus China. When China declared its intent to uh, somehow be engaged in, uh, with these countries in the special format, it <coughs> declared that it will not contradict the membership the membership of these countries in the European Union, even representative of European Union is uh, uh, inv invited to all these summits. The last summit uh, had a place uh, a few days ago in Budapest. So it means that officially it's not in uh, cont uh, contradiction with the membership. But if we are looking through uh, this list of the priorities, uh, it's, I think, eight priorities, and people-to-people uh, -people, uh, contacts is one of these priorities. And then just in people and pe in people contact priority, you see that it's not in compliance with the membership of the European Union because of these countries, because the cooperation is based uh, not on the liberal values, not on the values of democracy, but uh, it's just uh, erasing uh, the difference between democratic societies and non-democratic regime in China. So it means that how can we understand, uh, let's say, relations between Communist Party of Slovakia and uh, all other political parties, regardless of their ideological orientation? And wh what about the uh, academic cooperation between think tanks? We have liberal think tanks in these countries. And I mean, how, uh, how you can uh, cooperate, uh, I mean, between, uh, between uh, think tanks uh, based on the accurate uh, free uh, uh, knowledge uh, and research with the uh, ideologically based uh, research in China. So and it's a lot of this of, of this point. So it means that, of course, it's not uh, in, in full compliance with our membership in the European Union. And, and uh, but the difference, of course, is between Russia and China that China is nevertheless trying to present a kind of uh, uh, model, maybe not uh, considered as an alternative model to uh, the Central European countries, but attractive model with some attractive uh, uh, elements. So it's efficient economy, it's really economic superpower, uh, it's uh, culturally very interesting country, so it means that uh, the attractiveness of China as a country which is presenting something, it's much higher than attractiveness of Russia. And I think that Russians, they understand that uh, they will not be successful in presenting uh, their current model as a something which can be attractive uh, uh, for local population. No way for this. So Russians' intents are just to Relative, uh, relativize any differences between democracy and authoritarian uh, regime, between lie and uh, truth, uh, between a normal functional market economy and kleptocratic oligarchic an economy. So uh, in this I see quite, uh, quite uh, really uh, big difference. But again, it's both these uh, sharp powers, they are challenging uh, countries in transition. And uh, as uh, uh, Pablo said that uh, <coughs> It's a low level of awareness about uh, the status of uh, these Chinese actors, that they, uh, co the people consider them as independent. I don't think that in our countries, in Central European countries, really people uh, cannot differentiate between independent actors and state-related actors. But the problem is that many of them consider this 
state-related uh, actors as uh, acceptable. So they know that they are from state, they know that, uh, that they are from authoritarian state, but they consider them as the best communists. So it's not communists which existed before. Now they somehow change, they have a better face, they are, they are rich, they are offering something. So from, and I think that people, people know that uh, they are from the communist regime, but they are from different communist <coughs> regimes. Of course, we know that uh, the regime is as brutal as it was uh, before, especially in those areas which are significant and relevant for, my, uh, for p people in free society. Uh, I mean, freedom of information, freedom of association, uh, political activities, and so on. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, pe people in our countries, knowing that uh, these guys are representing <laughs> communist regimes, still consider them as uh, acceptable. So, Juan Pablo, I know in your chapter you've also talked about s there are uh, perceptions that China is able to play into. Is that, do you see that as well, that China is sort of portraying itself as a country with all these attractive benefits and that cooperation with China is a win-win? Mm -hmm. And that seems to, in some ways, uh, resonate with populations there. Absolutely. I mean, what, um, what they do is, is not only want to portray themselves as, as, uh, as a friendly partner, etc. The message that they are sending is that if, they, if, the, if the local countries would uh, engage with them, they would, do, they would do it for, it would mean that a, a better world can be um, built. And they, they ev all, the, all their narrative is all over the place and it's all about friendship. They, 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 they talk about friendship all the time, about win-win, etc. And this is something that uh, my perception is that this is something that the local elites love it. They love it. And there's, there's um, in fact, there's a hidden message there that you can hear. That's my interpretation from, from the Chinese narrative. But then when you talk to the local uh, Latin American elites, they tell you so directly, which is, uh, there's a hidden uh, criticism against the West because it's all about building a better world, about peace, about not interfering in other countries' affairs, about not imposing values to other countries, etc. And I think the Chinese play this very smartly and, it, I and I think it's very much appreciated um, by the local populations. Jessica, did you have thoughts on this as well? Yes, I think just to sort of take a step back and compare the two, uh, Russia and China's different types of approaches um, and how those impact democracy around the, around the world, really. Um, I mean, essentially, what Russia is trying to do is they see a playing field in the international arena that's stacked against them. And the only way to level that, in, in their view, is to criticize democracies, to bring them down to sow chaos where they can and stir the pot uh, when there are political tensions in a country. Because in democracies, our systems are open, political processes are messy, and in showing and emphasizing the messiness of democracy, uh, unfortunately, the, the negative impact uh, sometimes, especially in open information environments where we're constantly inundated with media coverage of you know whatever is the most attention grabbing, and oftentimes that is the political <laughs> tension in a country. Um, it can sometimes uh, impact citizens' own trust and perceptions of their democracy as an effective form of government, um, and this really you know has nothing to do with trying to attract people to you know attract ordinary citizens to the cause of russia i mean there is no russia doesn't have an ideology anymore uh, like it did during the cold war uh, in china's case I, I think juan pablo you touched on some what i was going to to mention which is this implicit uh, and very subtle criticism or maybe not so subtle criticism of democracy uh, that emerges uh, through China's uh, willingness to use this um, idea that it is an alternative economic model. Sometimes I wonder whether, you know, I mean, we could debate whether or not China actively wants to encourage other countries to adopt its same model, but it's a very useful idea. And if political elites uh, 
in other countries around the world think that China is, you know, their system is much more efficient at producing economic development than democracies are. It's much more efficient at building infrastructure <laughs> than democracies are. That's very useful to China, so I think they're happy to play into that. And I think one other thing that's um, a bit different about China's approach is uh, that as China's emerging on the world stage as, uh, as a global power, they're very concerned about shaping how other countries perceive their regime. Um, because the international environment, at least during the past 25 years, or a bit longer now since the end of the Cold War, has privileged democracies and other governments that derive their legitimacy from the people, and China doesn't quite have that. So in order to silence criticism about <coughs> their regime that uh, and human rights abuses that are happening within China, um, their techniques involve a lot of manipulation. Sometimes that includes carrots, sometimes that includes sticks. But really all of that is targeted at neutralizing any criticism before it happens uh, by trying to educate, and in their view, uh, elites and thought leaders and democratic societies to their perspective and approach and to reshape the forms of discussion that are happening about China. So. Speaking of the shaping these narratives and perceptions, the one surefire way to try to do that is through the media. And I know in all of these chapters and in the countries that were examined, um, there were specific instances where both Russia and China had tried to either acquire or place content in media. Uh, Juan Pablo, you mentioned that in Argentina, um, there were instances where CGTN, which used to be called CCTV, it's a China Global Television Network, had partnered with the local um, uh, television network to produce documentaries, and that Xinhua had also done something similar, sort of partnered on content. And I'm wondering whether you think, given your remarks on sort of the perception of China and perhaps limited deep knowledge of China, you know, how are these programs perceived by the general public in these countries? Are they able to bring context to these joint productions? You mean the the airing of the of yeah the when there are documentaries that air on say Argentina China friendship um, and planned future documentaries um, is the general public able to understand that when this is pitched as a documentary it's not necessarily a documentary in the way we might understand it that takes stock of a range of multiple views and perhaps presents critical views along with positive views um, you know what is the media environment like around China and how, how are these being received? It's a, it's a new thing, to be honest. Uh, the, the, the broadcasting of those documentaries only happened uh, a few months ago. Mm, I cannot tell you exactly what, what the reaction has been among the viewers, but I, I think it's already important that there was no reaction because uh, I've seen w at least one of them and it's, uh, it's nothing else than, than p uh, party nine propaganda. You know, I've been, I, I lived in China myself for a number of years, and this is the kind of documentary that uh, CGTN uh, does. But if you allow me, I, I, I can maybe s s share a few ideas of how they have been able to build um, uh, the relationship with the local uh, media corporations in, in the two countries that I looked into. And basically, on TV, CGTN, uh, they followed the same pattern both in Peru and in Argentina. They first uh, engage personally, they pay a visit, then they invite uh, their counterparts to China, then they sign some kind of MOU, and then in the case of Peru, they this MOU ends up being an agreement in which the Chinese uh, effectively will uh, uh, pay and produce media content, content and documentaries that will be aired on the on the national uh, public television in Peru. This is one of the things that have done. They have done. Eventually, what are they lo looking for to continue like that? But also that uh, GTN, G CGTN would be uh, broadcast 24 hours a day in the same way as RT is is being broadcasted in in Argentina. In Argentina, it's a similar thing, 
uh, but they, they are still under discussion. But it's exactly the same pattern, and they are already under discussion of, of how can the Chinese pay for stuff I that can be eventually aired on the Argentinian television. My understanding is that there's no obstacles for the Chinese to eventually, in the coming months or years, will end up uh, having their uh, global channel being aired in both countries. I'm, I'm completely, it's my guess, but completely certain about that. Then on the written press, they, they've been very successful in um, in uh, having <laughs> their, their the Xinhua and the China Daily Supplements, which is, again, pure propaganda, uh, being published by different uh, newspapers in both countries. By the way, G CGTN also had an agreement with uh, Grupo America, which is one of the big uh, media corporations in, in Argentina, exactly for, for the same purpose. Um, and, uh, and on top of, of, the, of those supplements that have been, uh, in particular during the Kirchner administration, in which the political ties between the two um, countries were so close, and those, some of those media groups had very um, strong links with the former government, and they, uh, they, were, they were publishing um, all kinds of uh, news content provided by the Chinese. Even there's uh, agreements by Xinhua with those media, etc. So one question we need to ask is, can we ex expect that when you, are, you have this kind of relationship in which uh, you have the personal relationship and you have an agreement to use content that China is providing for free, can we expect that those media are going to be critical of China? Maybe yes, but I, I think it's not, it's not very likely. And in fact, if you allow me one, one minute, the, in the report we describe one case of, of one, uh, La Nación, one of the big independent influential newspapers in Argentina, which uh, through, uh, at the time when they were very critical of China, not exactly because of China, but because they were very critical of Kirchner and the deals that they were signing uh, at the time, uh, the, there's, there's one of those visits that the Chinese ambassador paid to this newspaper, and very a few weeks later, this 16-page uh, Xinhua supplement was um, published, so it meant that the Chinese were paying for that. And then a few months later, there was uh, an agreement between this uh, Argentinian newspaper and the People's Daily, which is the biggest newspaper in, uh, in, in China. What for? Not much, really. There was a, a One Belt, uh, One Road uh, meeting in, in Beijing that they were invited. I, this is another example of the people-to-people -people diplomacy with no, nothing really, no hard agenda, agenda behind it. And then in the months that followed, um, you can see uh, uh, advertising by by Chinese companies, which they do all the time, by the way. And little by little, you see that, um, you see more soft power, uh, sorry, soft news being published in this, in this newspaper than ever before. Every time more and more soft news. And at the same time, the Chinese ambassador has been able to author six um, open articles in the last 18 months. I don't think this is a, a, a normal thing. I don't, I don't see uh, ambassadors publishing every three or four months in one of the big newspapers in any country. So um, I'm, I'm highlighting this example because this is the way that I think that China uses this kind of personal uh, relationship plus um, showing the money in a way with through advertising or those supplements, etc., in order to compromise or try to compromise. I'm not saying that La Nación is, is, uh, has been compromised, but definitely this is the modus operandi that China has to, to silence, in a way, uh, those media that, are, uh, that were critical at some point. Okay, so we do have some time for Q&A from the audience today. 
um, I would just ask that um, please wait for the mic to come to you after I call on you and then identify yourself when you uh, make your comment or question. So um, we have one here on the side and then <coughs> someone in the back. So why don't we do a few so that you have uh, a chance to respond to more. Clay Fuller, uh, American Enterprise Institute. Um, I'm just curious where the uh, panel sees Saudi Arabia uh, sitting in the use of uh, uh, sharp power today. And also, um, if I was a dictator, you know, I would, I would look at this and I would say, you know, countries like the United States and Israel developed uh, methods of sharp power um, first. So I think when you point out that for them it's all about the money, I think that's right. Um, but I think it needs to be highlighted where that money comes from. Right, in Russia by theft, in China by a monopoly on markets, uh, et cetera. I'm curious your thoughts on that. Okay, and why don't we um, take the question a little bit further back here? Hello, I'm uh, Cynthia Eford. I'm a former uh, Foreign Service Officer for 35 years and currently president of an association for public diplomacy professionals. And it's interesting that the same week that you were launching this excellent report, the, um, the State Department is, is releasing the papers in the relations of foreign, foreign relations of the United States, Volume 6, Public Diplomacy, 1961 to 1963. And everything you're talking about is in that volume. So it's, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. The Russia and China, of course, in those days had different narratives. Russia was the progressive force, and the U.S. they portrayed as bad on uh, civil civil rights and so forth. Now they're the champion of traditional values and religious groups, mm -hmm. but it's the same thing. I wonder, do you think that there is something in social media, the fact that we're no longer playing as strongly or whatever? that makes it possible for these authoritarian uh, countries to fool all the people all the time. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, why don't we start with those two and then we'll go back. So d would anybody like to respond to? Maybe to the second cards? question if I can. Because the first, the first question, I mean about Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia wasn't uh, included into our uh, list of countries which we surveyed, so probably I will leave the answer to these questions to Jessica. <laughs> Well, uh, in Slovakia, of course, social, uh, the social media, social networks are, the, I would say, the natural sphere for penetration of uh, different contents, both from Russia and from China. And by the way, uh, in, uh, in Slovak media, the situation is that there are no known owners of any uh, mainstream media outlets from China or from Russia. And I think that uh, the visibility of uh, Russian and Chinese uh, media uh, or TVs, it's very low. So I know that uh, there are some Russian channels, including Russia Today and, and some other TV channels in the uh, uh, cable networks and probably CTV also, but uh, uh, their content is not spreading through the real uh, TV broadcasting because the audience is quite low and all these, all these channels, they are not in local language. So uh, either they're in Russian, if it's uh, about Russian, TV channels, so in English, or even uh, RT Espanolis uh, in Slovakia, in some quite interestingly enough, in packages, and, and, uh, and Chinese channel is in English. But there are people who are multiplying this content. So there are people committed to the values uh, presented and introduced by both countries, especially Russia, because Russia has its, n I would say, natural alliance in the social fabric of, uh, of Slovakia, so the former communists. People with this uh, feeling of uh, belonging to Slavonic community, and and these people, they are, uh, I would say, <coughs> they are retrieving this information from uh, Russian sources, and then they are multiplying uh, through the social networks. And we know that uh, uh, it's a, I mean, s s some clusters which are uniting people who are against EU uh, supporters of. Uh, Eurosceptical, euphemistically speaking, or even extremist political uh, parties and sympathizers of Russia. So it means that it's uh, really it's a sphere in which uh, this Russian content, including the toxic content, so conspirato different conspiratorial 
I mean, narratives, uh, anti-Western uh, narratives, they are spreading through uh, social, social networks and, uh, and social media. And speaking about activities of Chinese representatives, I don't know whether Chinese uh, ambassador in Slovakia is so active in uh, uh, writing the op at m Maybe yes, but I som somehow I didn't register. But he really gave a lot of interviews to mainstream media and especially to those media which are at the same time pro-Russian and pro-Chinese. It's left-leaning, uh, very old-fashioned, nostalgic, nostalgic to the communist regime's uh, uh, online uh, outlets and uh, relatively popular uh, outlet uh, with the uh, quite normal uh, title, Hlavne uh, Sprava, which means main news. And this main use, it's, um, I would say, the main the disinformation source, uh, which is uh, spreading anti-Western, anti-American, anti-EU <coughs> news, uh, or comments, rather comments, uh, combining, uh, combined with news. And they are offering the space for both countries, Russia and China, and especially Chinese ambassador is frequently appearing in this uh, very strange uh, media outlet. Let me see if um, Juan Pablo or Jessica, do you want to chime in on either of those points? I, I have a, um, something to say on the first question, if I understood it correctly. This is something we come up often about um, if, if what the United States does in terms of soft power is, is equivalent to, to what Russia and, and China does do. Um, and in my view, uh, it's a completely different thing. Um, on the first place, because I don't see, I mean, I'm not very familiar with uh, what, the, what exactly the U.S. does in terms of soft power. But I don't, I don't, I am not aware that there's a state strategy of taking thousands of people every, every from all, all around the world into the United States to show them whatever. Uh, I don't think there's a state strategy with different agencies, uh, state agen agencies and, and uh, entities involved uh, in, 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 in such purpose. That's one thing. The second thing, um, many of the things that are related to China's soft power, um, for instance, Confucius Institutes. Well, it's perfectly okay to that they open uh, their culture centers everywhere and that they, they teach their, their Mandarin like uh, the Alliance Francaise does, or Cervantes, or other many other countries have this kind of institutions. But the difference with the others is that nobody is, I I the others are not, are not um, uh, forbidding groups from being, uh, or, or debates from taking place. So there's no way you have a debate on, on Tiananmen, or on Tibet, or on, uh, on China's democratization, in the in the in the Confucius Institutes, that in fact they are inside the campus of our universities, and I think this is compromises very much the academic academic freedom. So in this sense, I think it's it's quite different. Also, uh, the same happens with with culture. I mean, uh, in, in uh, myself, I've seen in in Peru and Argentina how, from the Chinese embassy, they are trying to stop uh, Falun Gong artists or critical artists to to do their shows, uh, the Shenzhen uh, Performing Arts Group, they, they put a lot of pressure on the local authorities. I don't see the, the, the U.S. Embassy doing anything like that. Uh, in, 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 in fact, culture, uh, as we understand it in the West, is, is you perfectly welcome uh, critical groups uh, uh, in university, in culture, etc. And just to, f to finalize, um, they have the right to promote their country, their culture, etc. What I'm saying is, for me, it's not the same what that when you promote your country, your culture, your values, your democracy, because what is, what is the U.S. and the Western countries trying to promote? At the end of the day, it's our systems, which are based on, on freedom, on participation, on democracy, on transparency. What are those other countries uh, trying to promote? Exactly the opposite. So I don't think that we can put them at the same level. Can I, uh, can I add something? Just one sec. I want to let Jessica, mm -hmm. um, if you have thoughts on that as well. Yeah, just to sort of pick up on um, the 
point that Juan Pablo was making about, uh, really, I think um, that first question was about, yes, what are the differences between uh, democracy's use of soft power versus the way that authoritarians are using it that, and the reason that we're calling it sharp power? Um, I mean, I think those are all important points that you you raised, Juan Pablo. Um, that, I mean, really, like when you get into the weeds of the way that a lot of these um, programs and activities that China and Russia are organizing, they are quite different. Um, when you read the report, uh, for example, I know one thing that uh, Juan Pablo highlights is how um, when elites are invited on these exchange, you know, people-to-people -people diplomacy and seemingly exchange type of activities <coughs> in China, um, <coughs> first of all, the individuals are handpicked. I think actually you see this in all four of the case studies. Uh, they're invited. Uh, they're and then when they go on the trips, I mean, there have been, I think some of you just, uh, the researchers described cases where, you know, they interviewed participants and they said, we had a police escort the entire time on the trip. Uh, they were only presented with one perspective, uh, the official perspective. They did not meet with uh, members of an independent civil society. I mean, China's civil society is actually quite, you know, when you look at, at the conditions in these countries, uh, civil society is so heavily regulated that, you know, even though individuals may be appearing to meet with, you know, Chinese civil society, these are groups that are the official civil society that the state has allowed to exist without persecuting them or shutting them down or regulating them to the point where they can't really operate. And, you know, when you look at the way that uh, <coughs> Western, well, really democracies engage in exchange programs is they often have, you know, an open call for individuals to apply to participate in the exchange program. So, you know, people in those countries have to decide and volunteer to go and then demonstrate an interest in why, and then they're expected on, on those exchange visits to pr actively participate and ask questions, and they're free to meet with whomever they like in, in the societies that they're visiting. Uh, the same goes for, you know, party-to-party -party exchanges and parliamentary exchanges and parliamentary cooperation groups. Uh, you know, we can talk about the National Endowment for Democracy. We have, as two of our core institutes, uh, two different groups, uh, the International Republican Institute and the National Democratic Institute, who represent two of this country's um, largest political parties, and there are others. But that just shows you, you know, that the U.S., you know, even though um, NDI and RI are congressionally funded, um, you know, the U.S. is showing that we're a very diverse population and we have diverse political opinions in this in this country. And individuals who, who visit uh, from other parts of the world are allowed to see that and experience that and hear a whole range of perspectives on what's happening. But when uh, participants of Chinese study visits go to China, there's only one political party that they meet and that's the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and then, oh, I also wanted to respond to Clay's question about uh, Saudi Arabia, which, um, again, we didn't include that as part of our study, but I would refer you to our, uh, actually, our previous research project on uh, authoritarianism goes global, because we did, in that uh, project, in that book, look at Saudi Arabia's influence abroad. And then um, to the, the second question about public diplomacy, democracies perhaps have become a bit complacent about soft power. Uh, and in order to, you know, really share your values with the world, you have to invest resources in that. And I think that, you know, what we've seen from, from this study is that the authoritarians <laughs> have recognized that, you know, soft power and values and ideas are very important. And therefore, they're investing their own resources and their own forms of... Um, being engaged in this sphere. And it's important for democracies, I think, to think about um, you know, where their priorities are and whether there's enough funding anymore for you know, activities like exchange programs and to support real authentic public diplomacy. <laughs> so uh, before 
Risha, I know you have a comment, but before we do that, we are um, unfortunately up against our time here, but I do know that there are other folks that may have had comments or questions, so if there are more, we can do another round and then you, you can respond um, before we, we break. So um, I see a question here in the front, on the side, and, and here on the aisle. Thank you. Hi, Dan Brumberg. I direct Democracy and Governance Studies at Georgetown University, and I've been teaching a course on this issue of globalized autocracy for the last semester, and I'm swimming and drowning in the literature um, and trying to make sense of it. And I, this, is, this panel is, is helping me to do that in certain ways. Um, one of the things that comes across in the literature is that there's a big difference between efforts by autocracies such as China uh, or Russia to ac engage in activities whose purpose is to strengthen their legitimacy and make them compete in the an international arena with the United States and so on on the one hand, and efforts to promote autocracy on the other. And these are related but distinct <coughs> efforts. Um, they sometimes overlap in interesting ways, but they're not quite the same things. And in your presentation, some of this has been a little bit conflated. It's not clear for me listening. Now, I've been to, I teach in Argentina almost every year. This time last year, I was in Argentina. And I was with a lot of elites. I didn't hear anything about China. Now, of course, I was with people who maybe weren't focusing on this. But what I'm not getting from the presentations is a clear sense, not of the implications for reinforcing the, in the influence and legitimacy of China abroad, but the implications for the nature and practice of democracy and liberalism in these countries. I mean, is, it, is, it, is, Arge is the fate of Argentine democracy mostly about Argentina? What is the impact of China on the nature of democratic practice in Argentina, or the Czech Republic, or the Slovak Republic, mm -hmm. or Peru? Um, it's, it's, your presentations really haven't drawn the distinction between these things and given us a sense of the actual, you know, soft power, sharp power doesn't equate to soft influence or sharp influence. Outcomes matter. Is it too early to judge this? Do we really know? what the impact is, what matters more, the domestic arena or these I international activities, and how do they converge? Okay. That's a great question. Why don't we go to uh, on the side here? Thank you. Uh, my name is Miriam Mimar Sadegi. Um, I uh, direct an organization called E Collaborative for Civic Education. We try to counter the Iranian government's disinformation and propaganda, particularly with our Tavana project. Um, we're active on social media and through uh, civic education and um, publication of books and reports and things like that. My question is about Iran. How much do you see? Uh, China, Russia, and Iran cooperating together. I mean, Argentina might be a good place to, to talk about that. And, um, you know, to the outcomes question, where do you see Iran having clear uh, influence in preventing democratic outcomes? I mean, I think in the Middle East it's obvious, Iraq, um, Lebanese, Hezbollah, Hamas, um, Syria, but where else in Latin America, in Europe, in, in yeah, where do you see the the intersection of Russia, China, and Iran in, in preventing democratic outcomes? Thank you. Related issue, and then finally here, um, Pat. And if there's oh, okay. Well, then we'll we'll do one more. Okay. Uh, Sarah Cook from Freedom House. Um, one of you mentioned, I think, this idea that under the, the win-win, there's this kind of um, hidden message of criticism uh, against the West. I mean, I think there's also, of course, the hidden message of, hidden message of not criticizing China. But, um, and I think this question of, of whether there's a, a subtle criticism of democracy. Um, I remember seeing a survey of some Caribbean journalists who went on one of these junkets to China, and when they came back, it was a series of interviews. Um, one of the things a lot of them talked about was that they thought China was democracy. They have a National People's Congress. They have a parliament. They have multiple political parties. Um, and that was really interesting because um, I, I thought that that was, uh, again, one of the ways in which the Communist Party often tries to p conflate. I think one of you, Gregory, was talking about the way the Russians are blurring what's a democracy and what's not a democracy. So, and I, so I was just curious, um, in terms of the people that you both spoke to who were coming back from these visits, how much did that come up in the China context that people came back thinking, you know, well, actually they, ha they have a parliament and, you know, they're really, their system isn't really all that different from us and maybe that makes it okay that, and not as big of an issue uh, that, that they're not authoritarian. They, they, Xi Jinping talks about democracy with, with Chinese characteristics and things like that. 
just uh, have one last question. Pat Merlot here can have the last word. Um, thank you. I, I, you did a, a really great job of, of bringing out how the people-to-people -people contacts, the day-to-day -day and year-to-year -year aspect of this in traditional media. So I'd like, if you would, um, to say a bit more about uh, the digital world uh, and especially how targeted political interventions, whether it's to cause confusion or destabilization or affect electoral outcomes. Um, do you see evidence of this? Um, what about all that we're hearing about houses filled with trolls and the use of political bots to, uh, to influence? Has that come out uh, in your examples? Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of very good questions there. Um, I would love to have you all respond to all of them, but unfortunately we don't have time. So please just pick something that you'd like to respond to and please be very brief because we do have to break and then get to our next panel. So why don't we just go in order here. We'll start with Jessica. Uh, let's see. I think um, actually what the point that Sarah brought up was quite interesting. This is something I've also just, you know, I have to admit been very curious about is, you know, perhaps there is, and it's a question I think we need to maybe ask more and look into further. Uh, there are a lot of surveys, of course, uh, about public opinion and about what citizens in different countries around the world think about democracy. Do they support democracy more than they support, you know, authoritarians or think that an authoritarian or strong leader would be better in their own country? But the question that's not necessarily being asked is, uh, how do you define democracy? And, you know, without that type of data, it's hard to know whether or not perceptions um, among democratic populations about how they define democracy and how they understand it are being perhaps um, reshaped uh, by some of these narratives that Russia and China are promoting around the world because they do talk about you know they do try to add a veneer of democracy to to what they're doing um, and I think it's really a, a key question and perhaps another side effect that you know we can't even measure at the moment but could be looked into further. Great. Gregory? Well, I will combine my the answer to uh, the, uh, my answer to the questions of colleague from American Enterprise Institute, and then maybe selectively to other just, just other questions. Very quickly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this American public diplomacy. I think that uh, speaking about uh, Central Europe, we shouldn't forget that we are allies. Slovakia, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, all other countries. Th we are in the same grouping of countries. We are members of NATO and. I mean, even membership in the European Union also creates for us the special kind of relations with the United States because it's still democracy of uh, a community of democratic states. I remember quite well how it was with with uh, American public diplomacy during the process of transformation. United States shared with us real experience of democratization, helped us to develop civil society, and at the same time, Russia was doing everything to prevent this. Russia was at that time weaker. That's why uh, it didn't uh, use the opportunity to completely block the process. But it was against our membership in NATO and the European Union, so Russians were very nervous. They then when uh, the uh, power was consolidated, then Russia started to do this uh, absolutely openly. So from this point of view, of course, it's a big difference between the current Russian sharp power and the soft power of the United States during the process of our uh, transition. Two absolutely different things. Then uh, concerning Iran, Iran, I think it's not visible uh, in mainstream public discourse in Central Europe, but now situation is a bit changing just in connection with Russia because at least those people who are interested in international development, they s realize that Russia is now cooperating with uh, Iran in Syria. So Syria, Syria war is quite visible in our countries. So it means that uh, it's not about uh, resistance against Iranian sharp power, but somehow the understanding that Iran belongs to this category of, uh, of countries is uh, increasing. Uh, then uh, concerning uh, Sarah questions. Well, Sarah, in Czechoslovakia we had also elected parliament and five political parties. So we, I think that the informed people should distinct uh, whether uh, China is really democracy or not. Of course, it's not democracy. Uh, but uh, yeah, there are people who are knowing that China is not democracy, uh, somehow adoring the regime because it's very efficient. I mean, and uh, when, when you see on Slovak market the Chinese products, 
So it creates uh, uh, the feeling that it, it's uh, a very relevant economic actor, so which is producing good things and, and uh, why we should care about uh, politics when China is uh, uh, willing, uh, willing to, uh, to have friendship with us. So, and then uh, the question Great about... We have to wrap up, so just okay, um, okay, why don't we turn to okay, Juan Pablo I, and we I can will, explore will, many of these themes Sorry. Um, since we have a second panel that will go into much more detail about okay. this. So. Very, very briefly, uh, regarding your question, I think it's um, still maybe very, very early. Uh, your question. Maybe, maybe very early to, to try to understand if it's harming uh, democracies uh, locally. But I can tell you that there's already things that uh, uh, you, can, you can tell. For instance, very little criticism of China in the, me in the media, <coughs> both in Peru and Argentina. In, Ar in Peru, for instance, there's a <coughs> lot of uh, Chinese investment in, in the mining sector with huge scandals, environmental scandals, labor scandals, social scandals. They never get to the front page, never. Uh, then in academic level, they... they there's, there's, there's no criticism of, of China. Uh, there's, uh, and, and I think this is, this is kind of strange because China is a, is a dictatorship and nobody <coughs> seems to be raising the negative aspects of the, of the system. So the fact that the message that, we, that, you, can, that, that you can read uh, everywhere is so benign on China, I think it's already, um, it's already quite bad considering that in democracies, the um, the media have a role to play, you know, and I think China is clearly disrupting that. Okay, and re related to this, uh, and, and answering to you, Sarah, um, I give you two examples. One journalist, uh, I mean, I, I'm a journalist myself, and I don't think we, I think we know very little about many things. Okay, so we are not a good examples. But but uh, he he came he came back saying something like, it was my first time. I didn't understand anything that was going on, but I was expecting a very repressive China, and I see the people very well dressed on their bikes with very happy faces. <laughs> That's one thing. But on the other side, I was I had an interview that didn't end very well with a former minister who writes every weekend on the most important ar uh, Argentinian newspaper. He told me that the Chinese uh, Communist Party was perfect, perfectly legitimate and not a dictatorship. <coughs> so, quite amazing. And so one public yeah, yeah, public just yeah. 15 yeah. seconds. I can, I, I, to your question, I don't, uh, didn't follow up this on, on, on my research, but I'm, I'm, I come from Spain. You know that the last uh, couple of months there's been a lot of trouble with the Catalonia thing. And I can tell you that over there, the, the, the Russians are very, very, very active. And, and, and people in Spain are really um, shocked about the kind of uh, intoxication. You say that in English? Intoxication of, of the news. I don't know if they will do it in Latin America, but there's some elections coming this, c this year. And I'm sure they, that if they have an interest, they have a clear interest with the situation in Spain because it's a way of destabilizing the EU. But who knows? I mean, if, if depending on the candidates, Russia could very well do the same. So unfortunately, we don't have more time to explore these very complex issues. But I would say that you know we've certainly teed up a number of topics that we can get into more detail on in our second session. Um, please th uh, join me in thanking the panel for their excellent work here.